Chapter 94, A Squeeze of the Hand. The whale of Stubbs so dearly purchased was duly brought to the Pequod side where all those cutting and hoisting operations previously detailed were regularly gone through, even to the bailing of the Heidelberg tongue or case. While some were occupied with this latter duty, Others were employed in dragging away the larger tubs so soon as filled with the sperm and when the proper time arrived, this same sperm was carefully manipulated ere going to the triworks, of which anon. It had cooled, crystallized to such a degree that when with, with several others, I sat down before a large Constantin's bath of it, I found it strangely concreted into lumps. Here they're rolling about in the liquid part. It was our business to squeeze these lumps back into fluid. Sweet and unctuous duty. <laughs> no wonder that in old times his sperm was such a favorite cosmetic, such a, a clear sweetener, such a softener, such a delicious mollifier. After having my hands in it for only a few minutes, my fingers felt like eels that began to be serpentine and spiralize. And as I sat there at my ease, cross-legged on the deck after the bitter exertion at the windlass, under a blue tranquil sky, the sky, the ship, under indolent sail and gliding so serenely along, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globules of infiltrated tissues, woven almost within the hour as they richly broke to my fingers and discharged all of their opulence, like fully ripe grapes, their wine. As I snuffed up that contaminated aroma, literally and truly, like the smell of spring violets, I declare to you that for the time I lived it is in a musky meadow. It was a musky meadow. I forgot all about our horrible oath in that inexpressible sperm. I washed my hand and my heart of it. I almost began to credit the old Paracelsian superstition that sperm is of rare virtue and allowing the heat of anger. While bathing in that bath, I felt divinely free from all ill will or petulance or malice or any sort whatsoever. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze all the morning long. I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborers hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. It was such a abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget that at last I was continually squeezing their hands and looking up into their eyes sentimentally as much as to say, oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we no longer cherish any social acerbities or know the slightest ill humor or envy come? Let us squeeze hands all round. Nay, let us squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. <sighs> Would that I could keep squeezing that sperm forever. For now, since my, by many prolonged repeated experiences, I have perceived that in all cases, man must eventually lower or at least shift his conceit of attainable felicity. Not placing it anywhere in the intellect or the fancy, but in the wife, the, the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country. Now that I have perceived all this, 
I am ready to squeeze case eternally. In thoughts of the visions of the night, I saw long rows of angels in paradise, each with his hands in a jar of spermaceti. Now, while discoursing of sperm, it uh, behooves to speak of other things akin to it in the business of preparing the sperm whale for the triworks. First come white horse, so-called, which is obtained from the tapering part of the fish and also from the thicker portions of the flukes. It's tough with congealed tendons, a wad of muscle, but it still contains some oil. Now, after being severed from the whale, the white horse is first cut into portable oblongs air going to the mincer. They look much like blocks of uh, Berkshire marble. Plum pudding is the term bestowed upon certain fragmentary parts of the whale's flesh. Here and there, adhering to the blanket of blubber and often participating in a considerable degree in its unctuousness, it is a most refreshing, convivial object to behold. As its name imports, it is of an exceedingly rich model tint with a bestreaked snowy and golden round dotted with spots of the deepest crimson and purple. It is plums of rubies in pictures of citron. Spite of reason, it is hard to keep yourself from eating it. Well, I confess that I once stole the foremast to try it. It tasted something as I should conceive a royal cutlet from the thigh of Louis Le Grand might have tasted, supposing him to have been killed in the first day after the venison season. <laughs> and that particular venison season, contemporary with an unusually fine vintage of the vineyards of Champagne. Now there is another substance and a very singular one which turns up in the course of this business, but which I feel it to be very puzzling adequately to describe. It is called Slobgolian, the appellation original with this whaleman, and even so is the nature of the substance. It is an ineffably oozy, stringy affair, most frequently found in the tubs of sperm after a prolonged squeezing and subsequent decanting. I hold it to be the wondrously thin ruptured membranes of the case, coalescing. Gurry, so-called, is a term belonging to right whalesmen, but sometimes incidentally used by the sperm fishermen. It designates the dark glutinous substance, which most frequently found in the tubs of sperm, after the ruptured membranes have begun coalescing. You can find these designations, the dark glutinous substance, scraped off the Greenland or right whale, and much of it covers the decks of those inferior souls who hunt that noble leviathan, nippers. Strictly, this word is not indigenous to the whale's vocabulary, but as applied by whalemen, it becomes so. A whaleman's nipper is a short strip of tendinous stuff cut from the tapering part of the leviathan's tail. It averages an inch in thickness, and for the rest is about the size of the iron part of a hoe. Edgewise, moved along the oily deck, operates like a leathern squilgy, and by nameless blandishments, as of magic, allures along with it all impurities. But to learn about all these recondite matters, your best way is at once to descend into the blubber room and have a long talk with its inmates. This place has previously been mentioned as the receptacle for the blanket pieces. When stripped and hoisted from the whale, when the proper time arrives for cutting up its contents, this apartment is a scene of terror to, to all tyros, especially by night. On one side, lit by a dull lantern, a space has been left clear for the workmen. They generally go in, in pairs, a pike and gaffman and a spade man. The whaling pike is similar to um, a, a frigate's boarding weapon of the same name. The gaff is something like a boat hook. With this gaff, the gaffman hooks 
on a sheet of blubber and strives to hold it from slipping as the ship pitches and lurches about. Meanwhile, the spade man stands on the sheet itself, perpendicularly chopping it into the portable horse pieces. The spade is sharp as home can make it. The spademan's feet are shoeless. The thing he stands on will sometimes irresistibly slide away from him like a sledge. If he cuts off one of his own toes or one of his assistants, would you be very much astonished? Toes are scarce among veteran blubber room men.